I felt yeah. it's really cold. It's really cold up in Joburg. It is. Oh, no one mustn't say anything that's embarrassing because it could be recorded. <laughs> I was going to say I'm sitting in my pajama pants, but no. <laughs> I... <laughs> that's the advantage of being online. Eh? <laughs> Only dress on the top. Eladi, Kayleen, Kate. All right, so just a few seconds out. All else fails, we'll talk about Darwin Nunez. Why not, Burgat? Oh why not? Um, so uh, Burgat is a Spurs supporter, and I'm a Liverpool supporter, and um, so there's endless enmity oh. between us. Oh, I'm told. What's going to happen with the Safa elections? <laughs> I'm really interested. Okay, so I think we are um, at six o'clock. Um, so we want to begin and uh, hopefully get more of conversation in. So we we'll see lots of people um, already logging in. We're also broadcasting across YouTube. So welcome to everybody who's tuned in, who is joining the conversation and really who are supporters of the Daily Box and supporters really of journalism in South Africa. This is um, a youth special youth month webinar. Um, this is youth month um, in South Africa. I am told I can no longer qualify for youth league membership. So uh, I, uh, it's no longer in celebration of me, I assure you, but um, the millions of South Africans, I think, um, who make South Africa great. And I really do believe that our competitive advantage remains the young people among us, their energy, their ideas, they are what makes us a better people. So um, this is Youth Month. Uh, this is the Daily Box, what well, dedicated to South Africa's youth. And the Daily Box itself um, celebrates its anniversary this week on the 16th of June, the, day, the Daily Box turns eight years old. So not quite um, a, you know, a startup anymore. Um, against all odds, it has made it to eight years old. Um, so I'm very proud of that, but also a huge, huge thank you to everybody who has supported us and really has supported the, the you know, the idea behind the Daily Box, which is really to just push new ideas into the South African media. So um, we have a stellar panel assembled here. We want to talk about uh, how the media landscape is shaping up, how it's viewed by practitioners from within, but also how it's viewed by the audience. What are the weaknesses? Um, is the media functioning as a public good as it ought to be? Are we working in the public interest? What is the public interest? Um, and the big question, what is the future of news media and journalism by extension in South Africa? So um, certainly not easy questions, but I think that um, some of the most pressing questions we have to have, we're hoping to have an honest conversation. We're hoping to have an engaging conversation. So um, please don't hesitate to use the chat function or the Q&A section to um, click through, um, uh, type through any questions or comments. Um, I will be looking at them throughout and try to get to them. Um, but I think that uh, we can get straight to it. So I'm gonna ask each of my panelists and I'm going to start with Kayleen um, to just introduce themselves shortly, but also tell me um, 
what's a, a particular piece of journalism that you enjoyed recently that has stayed with you? I it could be something up. you produced as well. <laughs> Don't be modest. I'm definitely going to put myself on. <laughs> Um, my name is Kayleen, um, and I think I'm the youngest person on this panel. On this panel, um, I'm 26, and I work for News24 currently. I'm a multimedia journalist, so I work with the camera for the most part, behind the camera, not necessarily in front of it like tonight. <laughs> um, and I think my favorite piece so far is to be the work that I did with my colleague Junior Kumalo in KZN, um, where we covered a, a, a very heartbreaking story, but I also think a very necessary story at the time about um, a father and his loss um, during the floods and the indignity that came um, with being a poor Black father at the time, having to carry his son um, up to the main road to receive assistance and for his son's body to be carried. Um, so yeah, that's just a short, short one from me. It was a very powerful piece of journalism and good to know the face behind the camera. I think um, that piece of work deserves no, uh, or rather requires no introduction to many people in South Africa. That's a very, very powerful piece of work. Um, we're gonna go to Piladi. Welcome. Evening, everyone. So I'm Piladi Sutusa, and I'm a lecturer at the Witt Center for Journalism. Um, a piece of journalism that stuck out to me recently, I'd say um, this past weekend in um, 168, the Daily Mavericks 168, Rebecca Davis made um, an entertaining infographic, should I say, about the Pala Pala scandal. Um, and I used it in class as an example. Um, so yeah, I, that really stuck with me. Fantastic. Um, Beauregard, um, you're not feeling lonely as the only man on the panel, I hope. No, this is how it should be. I like it like this. <laughs> so um, reminds me of my MNG days. So um, yeah, so I am the Africa editor at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which is a um, cross-border investigative reporting project. Um, a piece of journalism that stuck out for me recently um, so I told you I was very excited that this year I got to be a, a judge on the Sico Viles, yeah? um, which was very exciting for me. So there was a lot of journalism and I thought amazing, but um, I, I'm, I'm loath to go and point out any one piece in case I, I go and ruin anything for anybody. So I'm going to point to something outside of South Africa. Um, I loved the piece that was produced by the, it was a series produced um, by the New York Times on Haiti. Um, it wasn't only the, the series that was fascinating, but the conversation that it elicited about how the um, journalists went about their work, who they credited, and um, who gets to tell the story. So it was a lot of very interesting questions that were posed from, from that single piece, yeah? It, and it was, and I think the, the response to it in many ways was more interesting than the piece itself, although it was, I thought, a fantastic piece of work as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Kate. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm from the Association of Independent Publishers, which is this community media organization. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, 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 it was really interesting. Today we were having this um, really good conversation of, about a piece in Ground Up um, that was a really critical piece. And it was looking at um, the Media Development and Diversity Agency. And it was just such a thoughtful piece. It was looking at um, the, the, the kind of funding flows and the kind of, you know, what, what money is spent on what. Um, and there was a very critical um, sort of piece for us where they literally said, you know, they'd had 170 applications for their funding, of, you know, from our publishers, three people had been funded. And it was just that really important piece of like, actually, these are the facts. This is where the rubber hits the road. And I sent it out to all our members and the response was just explosive. Like, wow, that is so unfair. Um, so it's just that like local journalism that just speaks to people and to their reality. And it was, it was, it was just a simple piece, but so powerful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, it's the kind of journalism we need to do more of. Um, 
you know, the attention to detail that also makes it relevant to people's lives. Unfortunately, it's the kind of journalism that most newsrooms don't have the time for anymore, or the resources, really, which we'll get to. Um, it's a beta. Hadija, um, I'm, I'm a journalist, of course, uh, for over 40 years, and uh, I'm an uh, author and an activist. And uh, I, I thought now, I, I wasn't expecting you to ask me about an article, and there's so many articles rushing through my mind, but eventually I've chosen to be uh, kind of uh, a little bit selfish and talk about an article that's on The Journalist, uh, which is the website that, you know, some of us founded um, just under seven years ago. And uh, the article has evolved over a year, uh, two years, but essentially it's an article that finally, after many efforts and attempts or versions of the story, um, is able to now say, who were the actual people who initiated World Press Freedom Day? Who were the actual people behind the whole process? We, we knew about the Vintuk Declaration, we knew all of that, and then eventually we knew about UNESCO's role in it. But then through, we've got an article now on the journalist by a, a man from UNESCO, Elaine Modu, uh, who finally, um, uh, gave me the information that I needed. And it's, um, it's a Nigerian, um, a non-Nigerian uh, ambassador from Niger, who was actually uh, was disabled, who was at the forefront of initiating um, um, the effort to get the, the Vintuk Declaration or to have the discussion uh, in Vintuk and um, 31 years ago. And uh, I, uh, we on the next step we are, we, are, we are involved in is trying to really focus on him because um, at Rhodes University, there's, there's a Vintuk Declaration room. And then there's a, <coughs> a, um, a plaque that says that this man, um, Alan Madhu, and I've, don't hold grudges against him. He was, you know, responsible for driving the process through. Uh, but I was there last week and I said, look, he was a civil servant at UNESCO. And then he was given an award, a medal for this work that he did. The medal should have gone to um, Ambassador uh, Messon and uh, Ambassador Messon should be the story about him and his colleagues um, at the time who really pushed that um, not only for the Vintuk Declaration to, to be drawn up, but also that it became, eventually became uh, a contribution, a gift to the world, uh, because it formed the basis of World Press Freedom Day. It's taken nearly 30 years or more for us to, you know, uh, to, to, to focus on that aspect of our agency. And uh, so I'm very proud that we've carried that article and I hope that we will deepen it so that we can all understand that despite all our challenges, we have also done amazingly well. Certainly, and I just love that the variety of, uh, of things that have, you know, that have come to mind as we've spoken about, uh, you know, noteworthy pieces of journalism um, for us over the last while, you know, there's certainly telling there's the function of the media to to hold power to account to um, expose corruption or bad practice in the case of the ground up expose on the MDDA. There's the Daily Mavericks, um, you, you know, uh, the Rebecca Davis infographic, we're taking a very serious matter and also making light of it. Um, because we do need to be, uh, you know, we, we need we need to smile um, as well. And I think that it's often a function of the media that we uh, don't do well enough. Um, there's, uh, you know, Kayleen's um, piece uh, tells us about the very necessity of, uh, the very necessary function of news media to help us understand humanity at a particular point in time. And I think that that, particular piece, the piece of the father struggling um, with his son, 
um, during the floods told us, it told the story about how horrific the floods were really um, through that one man's experience. And I think that it, it built empathy, but it also told a greater story. Um, and again, and Beauregard's um, uh, you know, example shows us as well, the ability of the media and a piece of journalism also to build dialogue. Um, and extending from that, Zubaydah also shows us that, you know, it's, you know, a piece of journalism is never um, dead in itself. It, it enlivens conversation. And that's what we hope to do always. So these are, you know, some, of, some I think, of the various functions um, of the news media. Um, I am sometimes troubled, I think, in South Africa when we view media as particularly a response to state corruption, to public sector corruption. Um, while I think that is a very necessary and vital role, uh, it is not the only role of the media. And uh, I'd like to ask, um, I think that we've done very, very well exposing corruption, um, but what could we be doing better um, as media in South Africa? Um, Shall we start with you, Borogada? I mean, I can pick on you. You're my friend, it's fine. I'll ah, give everybody okay. else time to uh, uh, think. Look, um, like I'd, I'd love to see, you know, my forte has always been narrative and um, like the stuff that Kayleen, your work was fantastic. Um, and, and I'd love to see more of that kind of work because those kind of, of stories, which um, ultimately speak to so many other um, subjects, you know, I, I think that they are critical and also people can relate to them. Um, you know, when we speak about, I mean, you know, I know you read those Reuters reports quite religiously and you see the reason why people turn off um, from news is because it makes them feel bad. Um, they feel a sense of helplessness. That's consistent, you know. So um, and then you get solutions based journalism, but not to go down that road. But what I'm saying is that people want to connect with a piece of journalism often with our corruption um, stories, which I'm thankfully, I must say that it's not only focused on state corruption, but also white collar criminality, which I'm very happy to see. Um, but often um, we, there's a disconnect, you know, there's a, there's a middle class and, uh, and the upper middle class who seem more entrenchedly, um, um, that they, they, they more invested in that story um, and a political class um, than the, the masses, you know? Um, and so how do we tell the story of the people? Uh, many of us who now find ourselves in um, in journalism come from the people, but now we are middle class South Africans. But how we can still relate those stories and the concerns of those people, and we have to find innovative ways of doing it. Trying to find the most desperate, downtrodden person, find a child-headed household, uh, you know, a fourteen-year-old girl taking care of five kids, hypothetically, um, you know, that is not necessarily how we must immediately think about telling the story you know we have to find ways of of um of being able to relay people's um everyday concerns their their, their real lives um and it can't only be these negative things um because i mean you know we when you when you think of of the the condition of many south africans yes many of our people find themselves in this in desperate conditions but there is life happening over there we need to reflect that life also it should not be only the things of um, of novels or, or um, you know fictional novels because these are real life situations where real life takes place. And later on, when you get to my age, then we reminisce on that stuff and we talk about the games we played in the street. And eh, you know, we need to do that now. You know that that's that's part of journalism. That's what we should be doing. Um, and then I think we will find a better engagement. Um, and we need to do that in a more democratic way with more medium. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to that point, which um, Kate touched on when she spoke about this piece, um, which is that concentration of resources and therefore a concentration of ideas, which is narrowly funneled. But um, let me not dive, dive, um, digress here. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Borogad. Um, I'm going to go to Kate, um, obviously to pick up from what uh, Borogad is saying there, but also you work with the Association for Independent Publishers. Um, and often when we think and when we talk about media in South Africa, people have an idea in their heads that is maybe the SABC, maybe 10 years ago, it was the newspaper that they bought. Maybe it's the big 
web use website that they uh, whose app they have. Uh, downloaded on their phone. It might be the radio station that they have uh, tuned into their car. Um, it's not necessary when we, you know, it's not necessarily the hundreds of small publications across the country that are also working to tell the story of the country. And I think what we sometimes forget is that most people in South Africa can only access news in their own language through community media. Um, and that hasn't changed. Um, so when we think about what the media can do better and you know, also extending what Bogart is saying, what's the view from independent publishers uh, the like of whom you work with? Yeah, so, so I mean, thank you for that question because I think, I mean, it's been so, it's, it's been such a privilege actually to, to work with AIP uh, because you, you, you suddenly realize that there are all these little publications out, out, out there. And, you know, when you work in the kind of mainstream media space, you just kind of really don't realize, you know, that, that all of these publications even exist because. They, they literally, they are in rural areas, they are in small towns, they're in informal settlements, they, they basically, um, you know, cater for uh, particular communities, uh, geographical communities, but also communities of interest, so they, you know, what's really interesting as well, is there are lots of religious, um, you know, sports publications, um, you know, publications that are, that are linked to kind of like culture, etc. And so I think, I think what's interesting about it is it's incredible diversity. Um, you know, and we often talk about the fact that the media is just not diverse enough and that we don't get these voices from across the country, that we that we basically get this concentration of a sense of what is happening in the three metropoles, uh, but what is happening in the rest of the country, we just don't have any idea. And I think that one of the things that is really critical is that we actually put a lot more resources into these publications um, and capacity and tech because I think that some of the things that, that are, are um, really tricky is that, um, you know, uh, it is very difficult for some of these rural publications, for instance, to have a social media media presence or a website or, 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 or those kind of things. But, but um, you know, if you do start to actually build that, then you then you can start to create these links um, with, with the rest of the media sector. Um, but also we've got to be very mindful of the fact that you know, interestingly, print media is still extremely important. So there's this kind of interesting thing about having to be multi-platform because a lot of the audiences in, in these areas, um, particularly rural areas, I mean, they're, those are audiences that still love print. They still want a publication. They still want to be able to open it. And in fact, it doesn't mean something very special unless it's really print and you can cut out the photograph of your kid. Um, so I think there's, there's something very, very special about that. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, for me, the big issue about the media is genuine, real diversity. And I don't think we're going to see genuine, real diversity of language, content, voice, all of those things until we start to focus a little bit more on community media. Um, you know, and it, as I say, it's been such a privilege to be able to have a kind of front row seat on that. Um, yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Kate. And, um, you know, I, I keep trying to explain as well that um, when we talk about the demise of print, though us journalists, I think, talk about it with some nostalgia, um, because, you know, there was always that kind of prestige attached to seeing your name in print. But I think that what we're missing as well is the accessibility of news at a low price point. And that's what print um, represented. And indeed, for many community news, it's, you know, uh, for many communities, it's free. Um, those uh, community papers are free. And I think that that's uh, the, the kind of divide that we have to bridge um, if indeed print continues to fall away. Um, so, Pladi, you're working um, with the very clever people at WITS, um, giving us our next generation of journalists um, and you know, thinking about the future as well. What can we be doing better, do you think? Uh, I think yeah, just to touch on a little bit of what Kate was saying, the fact that um, we aren't really reaching South Africa in its totality in our coverage is a little bit of a problem. So what I'm trying to incorporate in my teaching is that storytelling ability. So even if you are telling a big national story, finding those people whose 
daily lives are impacted by that story might be more effective than just saying ABC has happened. So I think um, the future is bright. I, I was shocked to find out, you know, that there are still people willing to pay for journalism education and um, embark on this journey. And I spend a lot of my time trying to reassure people that they've made the right decision. Um, but looking forward, I think we need to go back to genuine human interest storytelling that reflects people to themselves. So that thing of cutting out that picture of your kid at the hockey, people do want that. They want to see themselves in these stories. And sure, they need to know about, you know, the public protector versus the president, but do they need to know that four days in a row as the headline story? I don't think so. So we need to go back to telling people's daily lived reality reflected back at them um, and yeah, that, that takes investment and it takes time. And because of the sort of metamorphosis that journalism is going through, I think it's a perfect opportunity to decide who we want to be as a fraternity and be, you know, take action and, and not be reactionary for once about um, what we want to see happen in the future. Thanks. Kaylee? Uh, so, I, I enjoy both uh, Pilabi and Kate's points, but I think in, in creating diversity um, in this journalism space, I think we then also have to question, go back to the question rather who the news is for. Um, and I think it could be easy to, you know, get these little, get into communities and tell community stories, but there's also an, an element of parachuting and bring being in the national media um, into you know spaces when stories happen in these kinds of communities instead of building it you know from the ground up so who is the news for but also who gets to tell the the stories of those people um, so I think it's important for to also build that gap in terms of getting community uh, community journalists giving them resources giving them capacity um, and also it allows for trust you know, um, it allows for trust in these community stories because I think one of the challenges is when you come as a as a big media house and you come into a community and you want to tell their stories, it's like, who are you? Um, and I think that's a rightful question. You know, it's it's easier for somebody to speak to people that they know and they trust. And I think it's it also makes the story uh, much easier to relay when it's somebody from your hood, somebody who's speaking your language, um, somebody that you can relate to so yeah definitely i think those two points is to to redefine who the, the news is for and who gets to tell people's stories i think that's essential really uh, let's go to zubeda zubeda what could we be doing better you've obviously been around um for ages um you've seen this industry transform in many many ways I guess in some ways for the good, in some ways not so good. Um, but if you could pick out one particular thing that you think we should really be doing better. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I must be careful now to really just choose something because there's just so many things. I, I think Let us that, have it. <laughs> I think firstly, we, we, we mustn't be completely hard on ourselves. If you compare our situation to 40 years ago when I was a junior reporter, the diversity that we have now is incredible. You know, the diversity is incredible. And I would like to see an exercise where we, you know, if I had the, the energy, but one of you could do it to kind of list all those um, those news outlets all over the show. I mean, there are many, 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 and I come across them when I go around the country or speak to people. So there's no shortage of that. And that was never there before. And um, I'm not talking about the mainstream. What The problem that we have is that, or oh, one of the problems that we have is that and it was mentioned uh, um, earlier, I don't know if Kate said it or if uh, Kayleen said it, but we are, we are focused just on certain stories. And so every morning I open the paper, if I open the Cape Times, which is our daily paper or the, 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 the business day or whatever, then there are certain stories there. And, 
And we all know, and Bureaucrat said that, we all know that there's negative news fatigue at the moment in the world. I mean, we've got all the stats. So there's negative news fatigue and we are in a very difficult moment in our country and in the world. And so how do we lift ourselves out of that? And one of the elements of that is the way we tell our stories and the way we kind of frame our stories and the way we give hope to people. Because if you don't do that and if you just bludgeon, we've been bludgeoned. I mean, yeah, I've got, it's, uh, there were 25.2 billion uh, uh, results on Google um, uh, describing COVID stories. Can you imagine in 2022, there was a Google search, 25.2 billion. And then as soon as that was done, we started having the war. And, you know, so we are being, our minds are being bombarded. And, and in South Africa, I think we've really tilted onto the side because of all the bad things that are happening, we've tilted onto the side of complete and being completely cynic, starting to become cynical. But we mustn't be cynical, we must be skeptical, we must turn everything around, and we must try, I don't have the answer how to do this. Um, the one thing is solutions journalism, but I'm sure if we sat together and we, we brainstormed, we would come up with um, how to present a more balanced picture of the good and the bad in our country. And you need that good, you need that uh, agency, you need people doing things, showing other people what they're doing to solve their problems and to, to live beautifully in order for um, them to lift and deal with the challenges that we have. So that's just one little, I mean, I can go on and on about this. I'm just one element that nobody, take your family, imagine in your family, you are being told all the time how bad you are. Imagine you told that you run your family like that, all the time how terrible you are. It's never like that. It's always something that that's we're doing wrong. And at the moment we've got a lot wrong, but are we saying we can't fix it? Are we saying we can't do something about it? No, no, no. What are we doing? We're throwing everything out, baby with the bathwater, and we're miserable. And storytellers and journalists have got a crucial role to play, always have a crucial role to play in thanks. framing. Absolutely. So I'm going to uh, post this. Uh, thanks, Luandile Bengu, who's uh, posed a very important question. I'm going to ask. Peladi to answer it, but I, um, so Peladi, he's asking, how do journalists then balance the need for good news and the country's reality, which is heavy, we all agree, it's heavy. Um, and then, you know, I want to extend on that a little bit, you know, Zubeda said that, you know, part of our job is to give people hope. Is it really the job of the media to give people hope? Are we out here too maminaing? <laughs> um, maybe not give hope, but I think there is a place for sunshine journalism in every, you know, publication. So not necessarily just promoting good news um, in tandem, but I think there are good stories and we don't focus enough on them because of all the terrible things that are going on all the time, it seems. So I think it's not necessarily that it's our job to give hope, but if we can give a glimpse of some of the things that, you know, people are being proactive about in their communities, like that Puta Di Chaba story with the water, that's that's a good news story. They are, there's still a, an element of politics in it um, and looking forward to the future in terms of coalitions. And it's very layered, but that is a good news story that doesn't just promote that particular political party, but takes in the whole South African picture and tells something, you know, that isn't a terrible story for once. Oh, God. Um, so I, I, I'm, you know, I, I think the, the framing and I understand the need for that. We, we don't need like good news stories versus bad news stories. I, I think people want variety, you know, um, I, I don't need to tell you guys about how much variety there is um, just in terms of, of entertainment for people. But um, I'll give you an example, um, you know, about uh, five years ago. Yeah, we introduced um, a, a section in the, in the Mail and Guardian when I was there at the time. Um, called a slice of life, you know, um, and after we introduced that, many people would tell us that um, that was the first thing they turned to, 
um, not the front page story, but it was the first thing they turned to. And a slice of life was, was simply something, a story somebody would tell you. I'd run into Kate and Kate would tell me, you know, the most interesting thing happened to me. I would take that story and tell her, Kate, Kate, do you mind if I tell that story in the Mailing Guardian? And it was presented as a first person account. People like that. They love that, you know, because uh, it rang more true. It, 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 was, it was something different. It, it wasn't good news. It wasn't bad news. It was... Um, it was something that was interesting, that, that, that people found interesting and enriched them. And they took it in very many different ways, you know, it enriched their lives um, in some way or form. Other people have now followed suit and done similar things. But I do feel that, that these kind of interventions, which, by the way, that, that was an idea which we, which we um, copied from the St. Petersburg Times. Um, but, um, you know, uh, those kind of ideas are important for that kind of innovation, you know. Um, and as we progress out of, um, you know, conventional print, which is essentially some online journalism and to, to proper multimedia journalism in its truer form um, and not just video journalism, then, um, then I think the, the opportunities are boundless. So we also need to innovate in, in how um, we, we do that. But before we innovate, the innovation cannot make up for the lack of, of um, ideas about what kind of stories we want to tell. That is another thing that we also have to keep in mind. Sometimes we want to do all the bells and whistles and we do all kinds of things and wow, it looks fantastic. But hey man, the essence has to be there, you know, it has to ring true and people can sniff out bullshit a mile away, you know. Our readers are very savvy, they're very intelligent, we must never underestimate them and always have them top of mind. Kate, um, something that Pilati said was um, genuine human interest storytelling it takes investment and it takes time. Um, and in my experience as a newsroom leader, that is the two things that is the most scarce in this country. If we think hope is scarce, then um, investment in the newsroom is even more scarce and time is a long lost commodity. Um, so how exactly do we do this? No, it, you are so right, because I was just thinking about this absolutely beautiful story that I read today, and I think it was it was in Becky Caesar. Um, it, was, it was about friendships, and it was just one of the most beautiful stories that I'd read in a long time about like, what is the essence of like amazing friendship. You know, so it's like that kind of beautiful light and darkness in, in terms of like, I think, you know, and I just, oh, I was like, oh, I want to read the story. And I kind of didn't read anything else. I just read that first. Um, but you're absolutely right. Even with that story, you can, yeah, I mean, this was, I think it was a New York Times one. And I mean, the person had done 100 interviews. I mean, how would we ever have the time to write one beautiful gem of a story after doing 100 interviews? I mean, it's just, it's just unthinkable. We don't have the kind of resources. And so I think, I think you're right. You have absolutely hit the nail on the head. I mean, one of the biggest things for us is to look at how do we get those resources into, into the media? And I think it is an absolute uphill battle. And I think there are many things that we have to look at. And I think that we have to look at it you know, from all sorts of different angles. So we have to look at it in terms of Facebook and Google. How do we, how do we fight to get the money from those platforms back into journalism? We, we need to look at how do we fight with corporate South Africa to say, you know, please, actually, if you care about this country and you want this country to work, can you please put, you know, genuine major advertising campaigns back into journalism, you know, and, and, and actually invest in journalism? It's government itself. I mean, it, it, it's looking at all sorts of different different ways of, of actually ensuring that those those resources uh, come back into journalism. Um, and it's very interesting, just with our tiny publications. I mean, so we we've done all these stories on like, well, what are you doing to survive? And you know what we're finding is that most of our publishers have multiple businesses. Now, in a lot of ways, that's not great because it means that you're not spending that much time on your journalism. But people are farmers. They they have events. They have um, you know, all kinds of businesses on the side, but at least they're still doing their journalism. And we're saying, you know, as long as you keep your journalism alive, um, if you're going to you know, have these other businesses, well, for the moment, maybe that's what we've got to do. But it's such a key question, Khadija. We, we, we just have to keep on focusing on that because, because really that, that is what keeps our journalism good, quality, and also independent. So I'm going to turn to our young journalist on the panel, Kayleen, um, and I'm going to ask you, you know, if if time was 
not an object. And, you know, uh, your editor said, you know, take all the time you need and use all the resources you need. Um, what is the one story that you would really, really like to tell? Uh, I hope nobody's going to be out here stealing my ideas. <laughs> um, you just let us know. We, 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 we'll, we'll sort them out. Okay, cool. This is on a public platform, so I've, I've, I've got proof now. But if I had all the time and capacity, resources, everything, I think the one story that I would want to tell is... <sighs> is really about the impact of the deep impact of apartheid um, on our people today. I think I've read quite deeply on you know, some of the, the traumas, but not just the traumas, but simple things like why South African people are so short. Um, and some of it, is as a result of that, you know, like the lack of nutrition, good food, um, what our parents were eating when they were expecting us during apartheid. Um, and also some of the traumas that have been passed down genetically, you know, like the mental health problems that South Africans and young South Africans have, um, you know, how that, you know, good science-based research interviews, but also interviews with people who I would say were overlooked during that time period. Some of our own parents who went about life didn't maybe have the most heroic story, but were affected by it. And as a result, we were affected by it. I mean, if you look at the, the, the fallest, you know, a fees must fall and, and, and what we, we as young people took from our parents and saying enough is enough, just how as a result, you know, of apartheid, it's not just something that was like, okay, a historical big story, but how it's impacted even the little things in our lives um, now in the, in the 20th century. I think that's something that I'm incredibly interested in. I hope you find an editor who gives you the time and resources to do that, because I think it would be a fantastic project. Um, and I think the that is the kind 24. of- it, they got all the resources <laughs> all the time. Um, so what B is saying that he's volunteering to speak to Adriel on your behalf. Um, um, <laughs> but uh, yes, I think that that is, and I think, but I think it's interesting that um, you know the, 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 your your story. I think you know the, the kind of historical lens. Um, I think is really fascinating, and our ability to understand who we are better ultimately is that we get out of that. Um, but you know, just extending a little bit um, from what you've said, and I think you know, just bringing it back to journalism and the media in South Africa. So Beda's point, you know, pointed out that you know she's seen the the media transform itself. She's seen this diversity, um, uh, you know, occur through uh, these last forty years through her career. She's seen this happening. Um, but is there still structures within? journalism in South Africa that are relics from apartheid that perhaps we haven't done well enough to dismantle. Um, because I think that we've, we've largely done a good job in terms of transforming newsrooms in that we've changed the demographics. Most newsrooms have been, you know, been able to change the demographics of the newsroom, but has that materially changed the structure? Has it materially changed the approach? Um, is, are these things that we need to change? I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I am genuinely asking, and I'd love to hear from all of you what you think. Laddie, you are nodding, so I'm going to uh, consider your uh, friend now and pick on you as well. Sure. Um, I think it's something I read quite a, a while ago that the when it comes to decolonization, which is one of the talking points for today, is that colonialism is obviously the structure and you know the laws and all of that. But there's also coloniality, which is the way people think and behave under such a system. So I think what we've done very well is changing the rules and the law and, um, you know, beginning to shift the structure and make structural change. But what we haven't or maybe didn't anticipate having to contend with is 
changing mindsets. So it's fine. You can, I've been in, you know, newsrooms where I've only had female editors, but there are people who still think, you know, along patriarchal lines, for instance. And there are people who, you know, were editors um, during apartheid and then all of a sudden had all these different people in their newsroom and don't know their lived experiences intimately enough to be able to hear them when they say, no, we have to tell this in the story because it's important. They're just like, oh, no, but those are not people we ever serve. I mean, even something as simple as still italicizing um, indigenous names or uh, phrases in our text, like why? This is a country with, you know, all those languages as official languages. So why are we not italicizing the Afrikaans? Or do you know what I mean? So it's small things like that that are a bit more invisible that I think um, can't be changed by just putting the right people in certain positions or newsrooms. Um, it's a it's a cultural shift that needs to take happen on a more wild scale level. But Claudia, um, if I could just uh, continue there, when editors. Um, managers, whatever you want to call them, when they are so busy just trying to, first of all, tell the news um, of a country that's a bit crazy um, and on any given day. We are a crazy people in a crazy place. Um, and it's hard enough trying to make sense of it all on a good day. Um, and also make sure that, you know, your bills are all paid, that, you know, your resources are being adequately distributed. Mm -hmm. You need to think about innovation and, you know, um, how we're going to serve the you know future users or uh, future audiences, and then on top of that, we're saying okay. Also, you've got to think about hey, how is history underpinning your approach here? Um, what is the incentive really for newsroom leaders to do this? The incentive, I think, is genuinely being part of the democratic project, and it's going to take you doing a bit of extra work and putting in a bit of extra hard slog to genuinely be part of that project. Otherwise, it's all just for show. Um, Beauregard, we were together um, at the Mail and Guardian, of course. Um, and um, you've obviously you, you've obviously been around for much longer than me. I'm not as old as him. I just want to I just want to make that clear. Um, <laughs> but I I remember us talking about the fact that that newsroom, you know, at that period in time, perhaps was one of the most democratic spaces we had ever been in. Um, because it was a space in which uh, particularly young people um, articulated their concerns and their ideas very forcefully um, and in a way that reshaped our approach. Um, and, you know, exa exactly Pilates um, example about italicizing indigenous languages that was something that was raised in our newsroom is something that we actively took a decision to change but that wouldn't have happened if a young person didn't actually raise her hand and say why are we still doing this right um but uh, you know uh, creating that uh, you know that space is fraught with other complications as well it's not always the you know, journalists are not the easiest people um and then you know managing that is also a little complicated so what advice would you give really to anybody else um, who might want to um, ensure that young journalists particularly are able to re reshape the approach of newsrooms in South Africa? Look, I, I think that, that one of the things we have to recognize is that there's a, a historical um, structure which is inherent, especially to print newsrooms because that's the oldest media in South Africa. And print media still leads the news agenda, of course. So, um, you know, there's that power that comes with it. And so, you know, it's one thing to say you don't want to pay lip service to having younger people or, or, you know, new journalists having the same say in your newsroom. And I mean, look, you know, I don't have to blow smoke up your ass, but you need leadership. And, and, and you created that platform, you created the space and said, we're going to do it like this. But, but so, so it's not like, yes, there is an equality. That, that is afforded to everyone, but you still need to lead that process. You still need that leadership. So there is still kind of a hierarchy because you're the one saying, okay, speak, 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 and the like. But um, you need to also then also uh, engage with people who don't 
often don't agree with you. You know, um, we were fortunate to have all these fiery people who were um, attracted to the idea of the Mailing Guardian. They were attracted to certain personalities who were at the newspaper, who they read, and that they aspired to be like, or they felt that this was a voice, this was a space where they can have that kind of equality of voice. And so they came to that place, you know. And yes, they could have had better paid jobs probably elsewhere, but they, they believed in, um, you know, what Pilad is talking about, you know, um, this democratic project, you know, um, and, and they believe that the ideas would be, um, would be allowed to evolve better in that space. So, so, so what you want to do is you've got to allow things to actually follow a course that you might not feel comfortable with and give it that space to run that course. Um, and then, of course, as a leader, you must also be able to say, look, guys, that's not working out. Let's try something different. You know, people are not always going to agree with you, but um, you must make people understand um, why things happened and also afford them the, the um, but all, uh, afford them the space to experiment. Um, but also then um, but also not only leave it to the to the to, uh, not only feel like we are letting young people um, just run with everything. We also, a lot of our battle was fighting with the older journalists, you know, um, not the battle, but we, we actually had to tell people like, listen, guys, we want to try something new. This is what is being informed by the people here. And then we had all the journalists, no, no, that's not the way we do it. No, no, no. And they, I mean, we had that struggle constantly, you know, and, and that is maybe the more difficult thing, you know. Um, uh, and, and I mean, we, I, I think we, we did really well, you know, we had, you know, the, the grouchy, the, the, quintessential grouchy sub who um who we, we had to bring around and say like and, and convince that person because you can't beat people over the head you have to have people's buy-in because in journalism the easiest thing to do amongst people who you work with is for them to sabotage what you're doing absolutely um so we are nearing uh we've got 10 minutes left um i want to ask the audience to this is perhaps your last chance to uh, ask any questions. Um, thanks to Jordan um, for highlighting the work that Coat This Woman does. I think that uh, Coat This Woman uh, really is doing such a good job of forcing us actually to rethink who we quote in our news stories and why we do that. And I think that uh, the work they do in curating the, uh, the database of women experts um, is essential and uh, something that uh, I think that the, the media in South Africa is much richer for. Uh, Borgar, is that your hand up? Yes. Um, I, 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 look, the one thing I did want to raise, and we touched on a few times here, but we didn't really discuss maybe, and, and I'd be interested to know what other people think about this, is, is that concentration of, um, of funding um, at specific <laughs> institutions. I think that it, is a, it, it, it stifles the diversity of voices that we hear. And I do understand, yes, and, and um, what Zubaydah is saying, yes, we are in a much different space from 40 years ago. But that said, I, it really concerns me. Um, and so when I've spoken to funders, my own experience, when I've spoken to funders and I've asked them, how can you just keep giving this one and that one and that one money, you know? Um, it sounds like they all sing off the same hymn sheet. Hymn sheet. Um, so it sounds like you guys like to promote this particular agenda. Because at the end of the day, you know, um, these guys are funders and then we have to also question, you know, what are they pushing? What is the idea that they're pushing? So, um, and, and, and my concern is that often, um, and, and funders, of course, we, the reason I raise this is because so much of our media relies these days on funding, you know, conventional mainstream media and new media, of course, um, are almost um, some of them are wholly reliant on funding. And then and, and when I do question this, um, you know, People say, well, you know, we try to understand better what the media is about. And these guys, they, they now to present what they're doing and the like. Um, and then we end up with them. Um, and and, and the, the funders seem to care very little for what we have tried to achieve as a South African media fraternity. What we have tried to uh, achieve in terms of diversity. What we have tried to achieve in terms of equity. They seem to pay that no mind. It is a real bugbear of mine. Um, and I mean, I can go on about this, and but, but it, it, it does really concern me. And I mean, I've, I've tried to have uh, to speak to people who, who are the people who disperse funds um, or have some role in that, including my sister. 
Um, and I've told her, you know, you guys need to look at this, you know, and, and, and they, they say, yes, they, you know, the, the answer they get is, no, we'll get there tomorrow, 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 we, we're working on that. Tomorrow never <laughs> comes. This is like, you know, I'm quoting a rerun of Annie over here. Pilati. So I think my utopian answer for, um, for that question is, so something akin to, you know, the multi-party democracy fund. I don't know how we'd get, uh, how we'd force people to donate in that way, but I think that would be one of the most fairer sort of systems of distributing those funds. And like we were mentioning earlier, reach those pockets that, you know, some mainstream newsrooms can't, or even um, funding those community um, organizations and publications to go further than they already do. So that's my sort of utopian <laughs> fix. I don't know how we do it without like a clear and firm dictator in place to make it so, but uh, yeah. It's, it's not actually utopian, Pladi. Um, you know, th that kind of like in-country fund model, uh, country fund model, uh, it was actually one of the recommendations in the Satchel report um, for, in the SANEF um, ethics inquiry. So that was one of the yeah. recommendations from Judge Satchel. Um, but it's also a model that's being experimented with um, in various degrees of maturity in uh, Kenya, in Sierra Leone, um, as well as Colombia. Um, and uh, New Zealand, although a very different economy uh, with you know, different access to resources, um, have been quite successful actually in implementing a, a national fund. Um, so I think that that definitely if I think about you know, what, what is the future for funding media, I think that kind of national fund is essential, um, but it's about how to get everybody uh, on the same page, how to uh, ensure that government ha you know, will support it, but will not interfere mm. um, with the way the funds are distributed. So you know, all of those, uh, you know, but then there's also, you know, there's uh, the, the challenge of getting all the media houses to work together to ensure that um, the smaller, uh, groups like the uh, like the people that Kate um, works with are not also cut out um, of any deals that are made. So I think that if we, um, you know, if we work well, we could potentially get there. Um, and I know that SANEF is investing some time um, in doing this. And um, Luandile again is saying, do you think uh, institutes like SANEF, whose editors are part of the biggest newsrooms in the country, should be doing more to facilitate funding within journalism and how would they go about doing that? Um, I'm not going to ask about about this question, um, but uh, Zubeda, any ideas? Uh, oh, Kate, let's go to Kate. So, so I mean, I think that, that you know, it, it's so powerful uh, you know, what people were saying about this, this fund and um, you're absolutely correct. There was a lot of work done by Sanish around saying, you know, actually funding is one of the key, key issues. And in fact, it, it, it impacts everything, including ethics, because in fact, it was an ethics inquiry that, 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 that this came out of. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I think I think what is powerful about it is the idea of like bringing all of these different parties together. Um, um, so you, you you know, so you need your your government, you need your corporate sector, and you need your international donors. Um, and I do think that the interesting thing is that you also they need um, somebody or an organization to champion it. And so I think that it potentially Santa could be that organization to champion it. It came out of their, their, their report. Um, um, and then just the final kind of point on that is a very powerful one with, you know, you were saying, Khadija, about how do we make sure then that, that the little players, because I mean, Sanif obviously represents a lot of the big players, but interestingly, it also does represent some of the smaller <laughs> players. So some of our, um, you know, publishers are also members of Sanif. And so I think you're right, it's that kind of balancing act of bringing in the big and the small ones, but also having a champion that really, really pushes it. And maybe just the last thing to say about it, it's very much about governance. How do you make sure that it's properly governed so that we actually make sure that people get the money? And that is just absolutely key, but you can get it, you can get it right. Thanks. Yeah, as, as, as somebody who's currently working on inter, an international fund for public interest media, I can tell you that it is, it is complicated. Um, but not impossible. Um, but on that note, let's talk, um, we've got about two minutes. Zubeda, um, what is the future for, me, uh, for media in South Africa? Is it hopeful? Um, 
I would say that it's it's challenging, um, but I think that, that there are a lot of us who are <clears throat> who are highly skilled who can continue to share those skills and to because in the end it's about the level of skill, the level of skill, and that's why there needs to be some you know focus on journalism education. Um, and how we all get involved with that. Because let's just say, uh, arguably, there's an earthquake tomorrow and, you know, a lot of media houses just collapse, but the journalists live. I mean, <laughs> hypothetically, what's going to be the most important thing is the level of skill that that journalist has in order to rebuild. So the emphasis has to go into the, into the skill. And that's partly also a personal journey. Um, you have to be committed to take your, your writing and your skill, your journalism skill, onto a higher level all the time. We don't really know what's going to happen in the future, but I think we, we can encourage people to, to really every day, you know, practice and practice and practice for their own, you know, um, uh, strength, not necessarily because they... I mean, it's important for them, and often people don't see it as important to, to practice and practice and practice for their own um, skills level. So that's just a small, uh, Khadija, there's so much to, to say, but that's just a small, um, you know, kind of, that's something I always emphasize with students. And then, of course, finally, we've just now, a group of us have just you know, uh, publish this book, Decolonizing Journalism Education. Um, and we, it should be available on sale in the next week or so. And it raises a lot of issues of, you know, uh, how, how we need to reflect on, you know, the all, all things that you guys raised, how we need to reflect uh, and consider where we want to go and what is possible, you know, in, in short chunks of time. But um, I have no doubt, I mean, I'm, I'm, really, I'm very optimistic because I've seen such a long span of time, you know. And so I know that if one plods along and you carry on and you carry on, then, you know, we, you, we can broaden and broaden and strengthen. And so, um, yeah, I think we've got all the ingredients, but we've got the biggest challenge, I would say, is that we've got a negative mindset and we don't see things historically. And so we are, we are stuck in that. And so we say how bad we are and how terrible we are, but you're not, we're not bad and terrible. We're making some huge mistakes, but we've been magnificent for a long time. And we still are, as I see the people all over the country, what they're doing. I met sorghum farmers in the Eastern Cape. We don't produce sorghum. They're busy with that in East London. I mean, there's just so many stories I could tell you that, and it's not good news stories. It's stories about agency, about intervention. So, yeah, just for those few words. Thanks very much, Zubaida. So we're, we're running out of time already over, but I, uh, it's my fault. I didn't see um, a question in the Q&A box uh, where an anonymous attendee says that he, they just want to clarify, this was uh, discussed already, but one of the problems the media is experiencing is that some people are already doubting the credibility of media and thus people turn to independent bloggers for news. Um, we're seeing this, I think, across Africa, actually, where uh, kind of the content creators, um, there's an interesting phenomenon in Kenya, if we had more time to speak to ab about that, but, um, and this person is asking, they want to know if despite all of the problems the media is facing, um, will media be relevant in combating false information and decreasing people's trust in the news? So I think that we've kind of um, done that, but I think the question is, will the media still be relevant in the face of the many challenges that it's facing. So uh, we're just gonna do a very quick round um, through everybody. Let's start with Kate. Uh, absolutely, <coughs> we are always gonna be relevant, but we have to step up, which means that we have to make sure that we fact check, we do um, you know, news that, that is evidence-based. But yes, of course we have to be relevant. Kayleen. 
Yes, um, and I think it's just it's simply because of the skill of it. Um, yeah, everybody can give information, but not everybody can give facts and present the news accurately the way that we do. So I think we're, we're always going to be relevant. Hilary. 100%. I think uh, journalists add value in a way that these unaccountable actors can't. And there is an obsession with opinion based, you know, um, reportage, let's call it that. But I don't think it'll last too long. Um, so yeah, I think definitely we add value in a way that they simply can't. Oh, God. I hope so. I won't <laughs> say 100%. And I'll tell you that the only reason I say so is because um, I agree with what everybody said before me, but after what has transpired in the US, which is a much older democracy than ours, it makes me very scared, you know, um, and it, it tells me that we cannot take it for granted. Yes, mm. we will and we should, but we cannot take it for granted, which is why we have to actively move against debunking, you know, false information. Um, and that is why, you know, uh, platforms like The Real 411 and every other media organization should not only be engaging on their own platforms to debunk this information, but also um, other platforms, which critically WhatsApp, um, to make sure that we actually push back because we can't just say like, that's just noise. The noise is growing. We need to be watchful. And uh, a comment from uh, one of our attendees, Rabia Mohammed, who says, don't forget the ethics for the fact checking. Um, certainly, I think that uh, ethical considerations and how we ensure ethics um, is strengthened, um, and the ethical responsibilities of journalism are honored um, to the public, um, is one of the key challenges that we have um, as journalists going forward. Uh, I want to thank everybody um, for joining in this discussion, and um, it's been fantastic. Um, and. Uh, yeah, hopefully the first of many, many more. Um, I think that um, we desperately need spaces to talk about uh, things like this, the future of South African media, but also just a place for young people. So uh, a huge thank you. I want to use this opportunity to say a huge thank you to the Daily Vox's Fatima Musa, who is um, the Daily Vox's single-handed champion. She really does um, everything. Um, uh, quite quietly in keeping the Daily Vox alive. And like I said, the Daily Vox turns eight years old um, this week. No mean feat, I can tell you that. Uh, my bank balance will tell you that as well. Um, but uh, certainly I think uh, richer for the experience of it all and richer for learning and understanding. And thank you all for um, joining this discussion. And uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel and we'll also be continuing the conversation in other ways in, in the coming weeks. So thank you all so much and all the best. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.